Back during slavery, when black people like me talked to the slaves, they didn't kill them. They sent some old house negro along behind them to undo what he said. You have to read the history of slavery to understand this. There were two kinds of Negroes. There was that old house Negro and the field Negro. And the house Negro always looked out for his master. When the field Negroes got too much out of line, he held them back in check. He put them back on the plantation. The house Negro could afford to do that because he lived better than the field Negro. He ate better, he dressed better, and he lived in a better house. He lived right up next to his master in the attic or the basement. He ate the same food his master ate and wore his same clothes. And he could talk just like his master. master. Good diction. And he loved his master more than his master loved himself. That's why he didn't want his master hurt. If the master got sick, he'd say, what's the matter, boss? We sick? He was as sick as the master. When the master's house caught a fire, he'd try and put the fire out. He didn't want his master's house burned. He never wanted his master's property threatened. And he was more defensive of it than the master was. That was the house Negro. But then you had some field Negro who lived in a house, had nothing to lose. They wore the worst kind of clothes. They ate the worst food. And they caught hell. They felt the sting of the lash. They hated their master. Oh, yes, they did. If the master got sick, they prayed that the master died. <laughs> if the master's house caught a fire, they prayed for a strong wind to come along. <laughs> this was the difference between the two. And today you still have house Negroes and field Negroes. now to another explosive case involving police and deadly force. This one in Cleveland. Serious questions this morning about the officer who shot a 12-year-old boy carrying a toy gun and the police department that hired him. ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas tracking all the developments. Good morning, Pierre. Good morning, George. As the nation wrestles with issues of race and policing, this disturbing case involves a child and questions about the conduct of an entire police force that has been under federal investigation. This morning, the Cleveland Police Department under scrutiny for allegedly using excessive force, the latest allegation involving a child in an incident caught on this surveillance tape. There was a guy and there was a pistol, you know, I saw his face, he's like pointing at everybody. Officers are dispatched, but not told the juvenile seen here is likely waving a toy gun. There's a black male sitting on a swing, so he keeps pointing a gun out of his hand and pointing it at people. Watch as police arrive, and in less than two seconds, 12-year-old Tamir Rice is shot to death. The gun, in fact, is a toy. Now, serious questions about whether the officer who fired that shot should have ever been hired. Patrolman Tim Lohman had recently resigned from a nearby department that was contemplating firing him. A supervisor from the Independence Ohio Police writing this scathing review. Due to dangerous loss of composure during live gun range training, I do not believe Lohman shows the maturity needed to work in our employment. We could not reach Officer Lohman for comment. But the Cleveland police admit they never checked Loman's personnel file before hiring him. He absolutely should not have been a police officer.
the nation's first African-American fraternity, has returned to its birthplace to celebrate its 100th anniversary. Isn't that something? 100 years of mistaken identity. Sigma Pi Phi Boule. It was 14 years ago in uh, July of 1990 when I read the LA Times and there on the front page was a story on Sigma Pi Phi Boule. I didn't understand how the LA Times knew about them and I didn't. And there, that told me about that they existed. I left and went to Morgan State University, where Dick Gregory's son, Christian, was head of the student government. And there at Morgan State, I told the students that I heard about something called the Boulay. And there, one of the sisters, Sister Tori, said, I seen a book about that group in my professor's office. As soon as he got the book, she gave it to me, and he never got it back again, ever. You were both in Skull and Bone, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go on. Sure you both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Women members of the Boulay, the men are called Archons, A-R-C-H-O-N. Friday morning, I will announce tonight that on Friday morning, members of the family and attorneys and I will meet with the U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District, formally inquire about starting a formal federal investigation on civil rights charges. We want the officer who did the choke, as well as the officers that stood around, as well as the EMS workers to be investigated. Let's pray. Let's get down, get down and pray. Let's pray. Yeah. And there's power. There's power. There's power. 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 I just wanted to ask if you wanted to respond at all about whether any of that was true. There's no response. Okay. And, and I'll tell you why. Okay. I think you were told, I, I don't want to compromise your integrity, but um, we don't, I don't talk about it. I have been talking a lot as a, a legal representative about Emmett Till's death almost 60 years ago and Trayvon Martin and how far have we come in America in the reference to equal justice. Past this camera, he reached into a rolled up gym mat trying to get a shoe and then suffocated trying to get out. His family never believed this for a second. We still have a long way to go, but it's, it's a start. We object publicly and loudly as we can 
on behalf of Michael Brown Jr.'s family that this process is broken. Um, two little boys came and knocked on my door and said the police just shot your son twice in the stomach. Liberals who have lifted them up, Howard. Paul, you conservatives make a mistake. You can't afford to strangle hope in people. Without hope, people become dangerous. No, Howard, you liberals have let them invade our society. You give them jobs, political jobs. Paul, you missed the point. It's only the smart ones we move up. <laughs> that makes it even worse. Oh, no, you know, we have to move them up. If we leave a smart one in the ghetto, he might develop into a leader against us. But if we raise him up into white society, we neutralize him. He feels compelled to try to act like us. He loses his identity and uh, his racial anger, if he has any. He becomes alien to his brothers. They realize he sold them out and they grow to hate him. He becomes worthless to them and safe for us. Uh, no, thank you. In fact, in his love for the creature comforts, except for his color, He's become one of us. You have to read the history of slavery to understand this. There were two kinds of Negroes. There was that old house Negro and the field Negro. And the house Negro always looked out for his master. When the field Negroes got too much out of line, he held them back in check. He put them back on the plantation. The house Negro could afford to do that because he lived better than the field Negro. He ate better, he dressed better, and he lived in a better house. He lived right up next to his mask.